In our last lecture, we learned how to use modal analysis to solve for the steady state response of multi-degree of freedom systems, and we saw how the modes contributed to the shape of the response and the characteristics that we see. In this lecture, I'll quickly cover um, some concepts in Chapter 5 of the Ginsburg book, which is basically a shortcut to do what we did last time, a faster way to get the, the answer. So you remember uh, we have a multi-degree of freedom system in the standard form here. And um, here I've included a damping matrix. Uh, suppose we knew that. And again, we're assuming that we're forced by a harmonic force. So we can write the force as the real part of some complex amplitude of uh, times e to the i omega t. And f's a vector, as we talked about before, so we could have a force applied to each uh, of the different masses in our system, as long as they're all oscillating at the same frequency. And l suppose we assume that we could write the response x of t is the real part of some complex amplitude x, a vector of them, e to the i omega t. Now we proved that this was the case using modal analysis, so it's, it's a, not really an assumption, it's something we know. But again, physically what this means is that all of the masses are moving at the same frequency. And the only thing that varies between them is the complex amplitude or the magnitude and phase of each mass. If we um, plug this into the equation, just as we did for a single degree of freedom system, we actually get something we can solve really easily. Here we get a minus omega squared m times x, i omega c times x, k times this capital X. And so notice we can easily factor out the capital X and we have um, this matrix equation here. That, that's not a minus sign, that's a bullet, so ignore that. But X is just this matrix, right, um, inverse times the force. So that's, um, that's all there is to it, right? This is a piece of cake. Um, so this is a lot faster, a lot simpler of a way to um, compute the uh, frequency response of a system. In um, software, if you use like ANSYS or uh, Abacus or other finite element software, they call this the direct FRF. And the one that we talked about in the last lecture is called a modal FRF. So um, that's really all there is to it. Let's next look at a MATLAB example. We'll consider our, the same three degree of freedom system we looked at in the last lecture. So uh, we have these three masses and we're forcing on the first mass. And um, again, in the last um, example, we used modal analysis to find a solution. So in this case, um, we're going to use the direct FRF, just this equation right here. So let's switch over to MATLAB and see what that looks like. So here's a script that does this and um, a really simple code because all we have to do is just define the mass and stiffness matrices. And we have to figure out what frequencies we want to use. And so I've just said, let's have three, 200 frequencies between zero and four radians per second. Um, you know, we, we could get that by trial and error, or we could actually, if we were being rigorous, we would calculate the frequency spacing such that we had enough points in the half power bandwidth for each mode. Um, all right, and then I create a zero matrix, a big matrix to store all of the transfer functions. If we go back to this equation, notice this is an n by n matrix inverse times an n by one. So this is just a vector. At every frequency, we just have a vector of complex amplitudes. So um, I create an empty matrix um, with one column for every frequency. And we'll stuff the answer in there. Here's the forcing. We just have a unit force applied to the first mass and all zeros. 
and and then we just loop over all the frequencies and at every frequency we have minus omega squared at that frequency times m plus k right so that's a there's our three by three matrix then we take the inverse of that times f the backslash is a fast way to calculate an inverse in matlab more efficient than using inv or the up the minus one notation <laughs> All right, and when we're done, we can create a plot. Um, here I'm plotting just the magnitude of the response. Um, let's just make this a little more interesting, actually. Oops. Uh, we can also make this a little fancier and plot the phase. So if we add a plot up here that's um, just a, on a linear scale, the angle would be in radians per second. So if we multiply that by 180 over pi, that'll be in radians. And uh, so we'll add a legend to say that that's in degrees. And um, here we can also add a label to say this is magnitude. All right, oops. And to, to make this look fancy, we'll do it this way. We'll fill the second and third panes with um, the magnitude because that's a little more, um, it's a little more interesting. All right. So um, if we just take it to there, um, let's see what that does. So uh, what that gives us is this plot over here. Ignore that one for now. Uh, so this is the magnitude of the response of each of the masses, one, two, and three. And um, this, is the, um, this is the phase. Um, of each of those and so we can see some jumps between 0 and 180 degrees as we go through each of the resonances and um, what I've also done if you look down here is I'm gonna find the frequency I'm gonna find the point just after the first natural frequency um, we could solve the we solved the eigenvalue problem before and in case you've forgotten if we do that the natural frequencies are, are these we have these mode shapes. The first mode's all symmetric. Then we have a 1 minus 1 and a 1 minus 2, 1. So those are the three modes. So what I want to do is I want to see um, if I find the point at which um, just after the first resonance, and then I add a marker to show on the plot what point we found. So that's this point right here. It's right about at the peak of the first resonance, the first mode. Okay, so at that point, um, the, the transfer function is nothing more than the complex amplitude of the three coordinates, x1, x2, x3. In this case, it's saying they all have the same, they all have roughly the same amplitude, and they all have um, a 180 degree phase. So in this case, the, because we have dam no damping, it's a, the complex amplitudes are real numbers, positive or negative. So if we plot the real part of the x e to the i omega t, that was our original assumption, then we get the response of the system to um, the response of each of the masses um, at that frequency. So um, these two plots, this is a plot of all the different responses we could get at all the frequencies. This is the response we get only near the first resonance. And notice all three masses are moving in phase with each other, right? So that's what we expect given that the first mode shape is 1, 1, 1. So there are other points on here we can look at that are also interesting um, 
if we look at the second resonance, so if we move our markers over here, and it looks like I overshot a little, so I'm a little off resonance. But anyway, if we look over there, um, now we see mass 1 and mass 3 moving 180 degrees out of phase with each other. I wish this video let me show you my hands, right, and show you how they're moving. And then mass 2 is basically sitting still. And if we could get closer to the resonance, we might get an even better view of that. Um, yeah, and then um, we can do uh, the same thing with the third mode, but I won't bother taking the time to do that. Uh, there's one other interesting feature that I want to point out, though. Notice in the blue curve, for, so this is mass 1's response, there's this point here where the response is getting really small. Let's take a look at that and see what that looks like. So if I grab a point near there. So what that's saying is that mass 1 is not moving at all. But remember, if we go back to our picture, we're applying a force on mass 1. And this says that even though we're applying a harmonic force, mass 1 is not moving at all. Um, instead, what's happening is that oops, what's happening is that mass 2 and mass 3 are both moving, and they're both moving in phase, and um, somehow mass 1 is able to completely sit still. So we'll talk about this more in our next lecture, but this is uh, the vibration absorber effect. So what's happened is that the force that we're exerting on mass 1 is being countered by the rest of the structure through this spring, K2. And um, so it's applying an equal and opposite force that allows the mass to sit still. And notice there are a few of these frequencies for this system and a real structure has, you know, many um, vibration absorber frequencies or anti-resonances, they're sometimes called, or these points where the rest of the structure moves around, but if you're sitting at this point, um, it sits still, has very low or zero vibration. So that's an interesting uh, phenomenon that we'll talk about next time.